It will. Well, whether you're, you know, dealing with this guy over here that Oprah made so famous, Eckhart Tolle, a little empty temple, uh, which is his body, he's housing a soul, his spirit is dead, which, which is the condition that has been passed on to all of humanity, called spiritual death, spiritual separation from the Holy Spirit, who is God, along with the Father and the Son, Ecod, one, one God, three entities, or whatever you want to call them, persons, uh, parts, what, what, whatever, uh, and they, the Holy Spirit is no longer in the temples of human beings in their bodies, as he started out with Adam and Eve. Uh, body, soul, spirit, that's three over three that equals one. Mankind is born as a result of being in this condition of separation from God, both within their temple body, I would tell you. Uh, they're two-thirds now, so body, temple, and soul. Two out of three equals in math. You're six, 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 and thus it is a soul in need of redemption that is spiritually damned potentially temporarily until the Messiah came. So everybody is in that position and everybody needs to be born again, thus getting the Holy Spirit back in their temple, sins forgiven. Name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and a reverse of the Ichabod, a reverse of the curse, uh, the Holy Spirit going back in the body, as I said, your temple, and uh, the environment later on will be treated and uh, God will live with man in peace and prosperity for a thousand years and then it's a kingdom without end so it extends out into eternity. Uh, whether you're talking about this entity who is giving you a bunch of religious drivel of some sort or another teaching people about meditation, he is just completely void of anything of real true value and you might look at him and you might go well this is a new age or so i already knew that got it uh but i would also tell you that what's even more disturbing okay so is when they come at you pretending to be christians and i'm really really getting tired of this um I used to listen to this gentleman, God Rules, uh, some time ago. I used to listen to a lot, I mean, a lot of YouTubers. Not really a lot of women, a few women, but mostly men uh, for one reason or another. And the moment that he started playing around and retooling scripture and saying that hell was an eternal, that it was only for one age and not the ages of ages, which means continuous one after the next, after the next. Uh, for those who have refused to have their sins put on the cross, which is what Jesus wanted people to do. Uh, if you do not put your sins on the cross, then you will have to go pay for those sins yourself. And if you don't let him get rid of them for you, they will forever be there. And so when he uh, played around with that scripture, I was done. And I have done that with many people that I listened to and many people that I trusted many uh, legit ministries, and so on and so forth. And the moment that uh, I am so sensitive now that the moment uh, somebody starts bringing something that is absolutely insane, I'm just done with them. Just done. Because the truth matters. And I know that uh, scripture tells me that few be that will, will find eternal life and let him, you know, gift us this gift. And there's so many people out there on, on a different topic that they, they refuse to let God alone, Christ alone, by the blood alone, through grace alone, save them. And they just have to contribute to their salvation somehow. They have to put some kind of, you know, something of their own up on that cross with that sinless perfect unblemished lamb of god and nullify the whole thing and people are completely within their rights to do that if they want to just what is a nice word for that um is kiss their eternal life with christ goodbye that is a really really good couple ways to do it in resisting what God wants to do. Now, one of my commenters, friends, had uh, mentioned that this gentleman was teaching weirdness. Mm. 
So I went to his channel. He's got quite a few videos here, and I went snooping around, so to speak, to find out if I could figure out which one was where uh, one of my commenters said that this gentleman was saying that the Holy Spirit was the divine feminine, a girl, which is very Kabbalah. And it really makes up a huge portion of your paganistic goddess religions by people that are not saved and not born again. And I just, Christ specifically, well, that's, that's horrible for number one. And I found it here. It's his uh, mysterious truth about the Trinity. And so this person is not born again. I, I do think that you can be in error if you're born again, but I don't think you will ever stay in error. And also when you start considering the level of influence that uh, you can have on others, nearly 2,900 people as computers or devices have listened to whatever drivel he's going to tell you. And I haven't heard everything that he has to say yet, but in looking down at the comments, people that have absolutely not the slightest ounce of discernment in any way whatsoever, except for a few, uh, were commenting. There was another video that I saw on YouTube before I found your videos where this pastor was teaching in a church that the Holy Spirit is a woman. I can't remember what church that was called, though. So, okay. Like, seriously? <laughs> what is God knowing that you're... Lord, your God has given judgment to him. I don't even know what that means. I'm hoping he's quoting something in there because that means nothing to me. Hence the saying, woman's intuition. Whoops. So? And yes, the word philosophy comes from the ancient Greek philo, uh, Sophia, which literally means the love of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I want to see what he has to say here. Oh, my word. Apollo, love of the Holy Spirit. However, the world has a counterfeit wisdom. Well, no kidding. And you're apparently passing it off to these people that don't know how to tell their left hand from their right. Um, sure. Yeah. The Holy Spirit revealed herself to me as a female as well. Do these... People not understand that you're not supposed to just take in whatever spirit or teaching or attitude or entity or human in a, in a potentially empty temple says to you. You're supposed to test the spirits. What do you test it against? The word of God. Okay. Jerusalem and Zion were also called a woman. Well, yes, there's there's a literary tool called personification, which means that just like Uncle Sam is, you know, pictured as an old man with a large top hat and he represents our nation, it's a literary device to help you understand. People would also understand the Grim Reaper is not actually a human. It's a state that happens to you when your soul peels off from your body. But in order to help convey as a literary tool this idea of taking a, a subject and turning it into a person is not actually real. It's something writers use and when you have Jerusalem or you have Zion being communicated in the scripture, specifically in Galatians, she is called our mother. She's not real. She's a covenant. The covenant gives birth, glorification, to justified, sanctified Christians and Jews in Christ. She's not a real person. She is a construct that has been given personification. She's quoted by Paul in Galatians 4. Oh, go to 26, 27, somewhere in there. 
and he makes sense of what Isaiah said of her giving birth to her children. That's glorification at the Harpazo. On the day of judgment, the Yom Hadin, Feast of Trumpets, etc., when he fulfills that, we get new flesh. It's the eternal life given to us in our new flesh, like what Christ had on the first fruits. And he made sense out of what Isaiah was saying in chapter 54, verse 1. And it makes uh, more sense when the apostle and prophet John brought her up again in Revelation 12. Oh, goodness. Okay, this person got it. Stop your heretical teaching. Thank you. Hey, you're doing a great work. It's in the scriptures and the person and attributes of our Heavenly Father. 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 The Ruach HaKodesh is the biblical Hebrew name for the Holy Spirit, which is a noun and feminine and gender. Please refer to the Hebrew for Christians as a guide. Well, I know the Spanish people, they can have words that have feminine or uh, masculine to them speaking about, you know, um, inanimate objects as part of their language. And if it ends in an O, it's male. And if it ends in an A, it's female. But we're not actually saying there's a tit for tat relationship that uh, he, the pronoun he, for the Ruach Kodesh, which just means the Holy Spirit in Hebrew. It's not his name in Hebrew. It's what he is. It, it's the title, Holy Spirit in Hebrew. And it doesn't mean that he, which is so clear, he is a girl. Just because there is a, uh, a feminine aspect to the word makeup in the biblical Hebrew. As I just explained, Spanish does the same thing. Um, I mean, this is just, you know, this really, it to, to come, oh, she, her, her children laugh out loud. I don't think so. Well, I mean, I can't really blame you. I have listened to most of R.C. Sproul's, John MacArthur's, Alistair Begg, and Paul Washer's preaching for long hours, and I'm not even Calvinist. I hear you. Leanne, I hear you, but I can't stand listening to you for five minutes. I mean, I get it. This is, just, so he's attracted all these new agers. John 1, 1 through 5 in the beginning was, no. The word, the logos, not God, God is deity, deities, divine, divinity, divinities, and that spoken words of wisdom is and blah blah. I can't even read all this nonsense. You've just you've you've paraded out this heretical nastiness, pretending to be a Christian. You're a big giant liar. You're leading people astray. I mean, there's lots of ways that you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but I definitely think this is one of the more creative ways to do it when you dig in an unbelief and then you play around with the character and the nature and the makeup of who and what God is. If God wanted to be known as a goddess, he would have that written all over his word and actual Christians would see that in the pages of their Bible. Bibles are thick, thick, and there's a lot of information in them. I am so annoyed right now because I am so tired of what I'm seeing happen in the church, yet, I am so comforted because God's word tells me this is exactly what you're going to have happen. You're going to have so many liars coming in the end days who will not hold the sound doctrine, but rather they will, they will, you know, heap to themselves teachers and they'll have itching ears and they will turn aside from these sound teachings and they will, they will turn towards myths, mythos falsehoods, lies. It's just disgusting. Oh my word. Tony, what do you think of people calling the Holy Spirit, which is Sophia in Greek? No. And rock in Hebrew, a ghost. Isn't that blasphemy? Well, I mean, the King James says ghost, but I don't love that. 
I don't, I, I'm not even, okay, I'm done in the comments. This is probably going to make me mad, actually. So he is going to do some major eisegesis here. I just feel it coming. He's talking about how we're made in the image of God. And he is going to explain the Bible to you because he knows as he parades around like a Christian and people listen to him. In his image, what it's saying is we're actually literally made in the Trinity's image. God the Father, man is made in the image of God the Father. The Holy Spirit is the female of the Trinity, and the woman is made in the image of the Holy Spirit. No. Children are made in the image of Jesus Christ. Okay, this is actually what it is. No, it's not. That is all in your vain imagination and godless chatter. It is all made up. God made Adam, and Adam or Adam means mankind, right? He literally fashioned mankind, Adam, out of the dirt of the earth. And however exactly all that worked with science, I mean, God's the one that thought of like water and oxygen and molecules and subatomic particles and, you know, all kinds of things. So if he's explaining to us simple in the Bible, it's not because he's simple. It's because we are. And he makes Adam. And how does he get the female? Let's see. Let's see. Did, did, did Adam trip over her? No, no, that's not it. No. Uh, God took Adam's stem cell rich rib and crafted from the man, from the man, I say the mother of all life, which is what Eve means. And then they, appropri they uh, um, procreate and you've got the seed and the egg, right? And we don't need to go over the finite details of how life is born. But did you know that there is a little spark of light that occurs within the uh, woman when this union happens? Very interesting. And uh, much more can be said about the Shroud of Turin and when the uh, Holy Spirit gave life to the body of Christ and the light that was emitted. And he is the head of the new creation in, uh, in Christ. Anyhow, that's kind of an interesting thing. I'm really into that stuff quite a lot. Um, anyhow. Okay, so what he's saying is just a complete fabrication. What I just told you is what the Bible says. I don't know why he would even be parting out the family and trying to take each one of the members of the family and somehow um, crafting them into a union with the Father means this and the Son means this and the Holy Spirit means this. No, and, and while God, while the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are separate, they are also so much a part of each other, much like the temple. The temple had three parts to it, and none of it by itself was the temple. There was the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies, and they all went together. And so that is to help you understand how God works. And you could put all three of them in a room together, the father and put the son next to him and then put the Holy Spirit next to him. And you would ask them, which one of you is God? And it would be most appropriate for all three of them to answer at the same time. I am. That's how that works. He's a liar. How do we know this? Well, Jesus said, you must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we know that Jesus, when he was on earth, obeyed the father okay so what does that have to do with having a level of trust that is just implicit within children they they just have this sweetness and they they bow to authority it is just in the social structure of life and humanity and that is what we are to derive out of that scripture that he is so horribly producing eisegesis on where he rips something out of context and then tries to strap it to some biblical construct sloppily sloppily so i don't know if this is just a man who truly should not be in the business of encouraging and teaching people this is horrific and we're only two minutes in
And I, I think we started late too. So, wow. Or I don't know if this is a professional level Mason that's just pretending to be whatever. I don't know. So he was acting as a, a, a an obedient child on earth. A child? N no. He, uh, <sighs> he was called the last Adam, the last man of mankind. He is not a child. And while he is God's son, he started his ministry as an adult. There's a reason, I think, probably, I don't know what all of it is, but there was some value in having Christ hold off, the Bible says, uh, till he was about 30. Now, whether that means he was on the edge of 29, about ready to turn 30, he's a feast of trumpets, uh, 9, 11, 3 BC baby. We know this for a fact. I have so many videos on that as well. Very important feast. Anyhow, uh, and he died in 33 AD. Now, if you count at the math of that, and we know for a fact that he died in 33 AD. <laughs> we know this because there were so many other types of uh, data points with the earthquake, with you know, signs and things happening in the sun. I mean, some really in the, in the, in the, in the universe, some really interesting stuff. One of these days, if we ever have time, we'll have to do some videos on that. But uh, he was, and I, I know this is going to be a little bit different than what you've always heard where everybody goes, he was 33, he was 33. No, actually, when you do the math, he didn't quite make it to his 35th birthday and he was cut off when he was about 34 and a half. And uh, anyhow, there was a reason why God had him wait until he was, you know, 29, 30 uh, to begin doing what he was doing. And there is a whole developmental thing there with the brain. And uh, I don't think that you could even remotely try to say that Jesus was uh, childlike. That is just patently ridiculous. What is wrong with you? Earth. God the Father is the Father. So that's a male figure in the family head. Oh my gosh. The, the whole Godhead, and I hate that word Trinity. I mean, I've grown up with it, but in the Bible, in uh, Acts, Romans, and Colossians, it says Godhead, and head means ruler, so God ruler. But people use use Trinity, that's fine. I don't. I don't love labels. Um, but, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all called with the male pronouns all throughout the Bible. I'm guessing hundreds, if not a thousand times, male, 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 male. I can't even believe that he can say this with a straight face and that people uh, just tolerate this and put up with it. I, I really, um, it makes me angry <laughs> because um, there's a lot of things you can be wrong about the color that you think looks good on you or the dress that you wear or, you know, that you think you can bake or cook or, you know, what it, whatever, whatever. <laughs> whatever but you the one thing you don't want to be wrong about is how you acquire salvation and you better be going to the correct understanding of god in order to receive that that is very important and the holy spirit is the mother no okay and she's a spirit no which is hidden no and where did woman come from the man's rib woman came from inside man from his rib something hidden that you can't see. Well, when God opened him up and took the the rib out, could you see it if you were there? Yes. And don't be acting like you know what spirit is. Really, none of us know what spirit is. There, There is a mystery to some extent. And when we, well, not all of us, but when we go to see the Father and we look at him, we'll be like, oh, that's what spirit is. And the Holy Spirit, oh, that's what spirit is. Now, so what I'm saying is our family structure is made in the image of God. Man is made in the image of God the Father. Woman is made in the image of the Holy Spirit. No. And children are made in the image of Jesus Christ. No. Now, what is likeness? 
since we're made in his likeness as well. Well, actually, it's pretty simple as well. We are mind, body, and spirit. By mind, we're referring to God the Father, who is head of the home, head of the house, head of the house. I think you mean soul. Of God, he's the mind, okay, controlling things. Now, the, the, the spirit is obviously the Holy Spirit. Shouldn't take a Yes, but everybody is born with a dead spirit and the Holy Spirit is not in their temple because of what I already explained, which is why Christ wants you to become born again. So you get the Holy Spirit to go back in your temple. A rocket scientist figure that one out. And Jesus is God in the flesh or the body. Yes, that part is correct. The, the flesh, the temple, yes. So you're comprised of soul, spirit, and flesh, which is your temple. Remember he came down on earth in the flesh? Yeah, we know. So he's actually the flesh of God. Okay, so we have mind, body, spirit. The flesh of God. What does that even mean? He took, Philippians 2 tells us this. He took on human flesh. He's not the flesh of God. God is spirit. And all who worship him will worship him in spirit and truth. John 4. He's not the flesh of God. He took on flesh to be as the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 45. This guy is not saved and does not know what he's talking about. So this is actually how it breaks down. Now, the reason why there's a lot of confusion on the God topic is because the Holy Spirit has been basically misunderstood. And no, he hasn't. We have extremely clear teachings in the book of John and uh, in the rest of the Bible that tells us exactly the role of the paraclete. He is our teacher. He is our guide. He is our guarantor. He is what gives us the spirit inside that is quickened and made alive. He is what gives us the ability to even have like what I'm going to call a spiritual antenna for your soul and your flesh to even get the things of God. Um, <laughs> the, the Bible is so replete with information about the Holy Spirit. You could do probably weeks and weeks, maybe a month or more of deep, rich Bible study, just looking at the original language and understanding everything about the Holy Spirit and what he does. No, we're, 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 we're not in confusion. You're in confusion. And the, the concept, uh, the true concept of the Holy Spirit has been lost in the church no. because of paganism, because of oh my word. Uh, corruption. In the 4th century, particularly, a lot of corruption came into the church. Um, Irenaeus was one of the very early church fathers. He taught that the Holy Spirit was a woman, a female. And actually, Jesus did as too. Jesus did as well, but no one really notices because of the way he said it. Let me show you. Did he not just say... That a whole bunch of error came into the church, and then he mentioned Irenaeus, and then he says that what Irenaeus said is that God is a woman. And this is the very um, core of what he is trying to teach. His thesis is that God is, is part woman. So basically what you have is a Kabbalistic he-she God according to what he is thinking. This here should be capitalized. It's just well, how come it's not? How come it's not capitalized? Um, wi wisdom is a thing. It's not a person. It's never been a person. It's a thing. The son of man came in eating and drinking. You say, behold, a gluttonous man, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. This is what the Pharisees said to Jesus. He said, but wisdom is justified by all her children. 
this wisdom here is referring to the Holy Spirit. No, it's not. What does that have to do with the previous sentence? I mean, I will admit that I will have to dig into this and that it bears more study, but wisdom is a thing. And he's obviously saying that these people lack wisdom. That would make sense because he's basically saying, you didn't like it when John the Baptist came in nothing. I come with something, basically. He gives examples. This is like in America, we would say that this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of a situation. Another way of saying it is that these people cannot be pleased. And so this has got to tie in to, you know, people and the acquisition of knowledge, which is what wisdom is. And there's probably more to it than that. I admit that it bears more study. But what he's saying is just insane. There, There is nothing in any of this that communicates that this is the Holy Spirit. This is ridiculous. This is an empty temple. This, this person, if they got in a car accident, they'd have to be paying for their own sins. Let me show you how you know that. Now, if you ask any Christian theologian about this topic, if they've actually studied anything about Proverbs 8, they'll have basically an opinion about this, who wisdom is. Wisdom is an opinion, but you see, and those are theologians. So you're well studied, can read everything in the original language, theologians, that, that they are paid to know what they're talking about. They may not necessarily get that across to you if they're Masons, uh, which this guy could be, I don't know. But uh, he discredits all of their training, all of their knowledge, and he tells you that if they enter in an opinion, uh, if they enter in some type of teaching, that it's it's only going to be opinion-based. And he is now going to Proverbs 8, where this is an example of the literary tool I already discussed with you called personification. And I already gave you two examples of how that is done. This is not the Holy Spirit. This is the necessity to use wisdom in your life that the Bible is using, which is written in the Bible. And if you go to the Bible, then the Bible informs you of everything you need to know about life and reality. And this is, uh, much more could be said about this, but there is not an ounce of anywhere in this chapter where it is suggesting that this is God. It is merely applied knowledge which is what wisdom is you are such a liar is declared by basically most theologians to be god no one of the godhead no wisdom is in proverbs 8 and the way it's being described it has attributes that refer to god no now what most of them do is they say that this wisdom character being described in proverbs 8 is jesus christ no however as I just read, Jesus talks about wisdom as being another person. No, it's a thing. And wisdom happens. Nouns are people, places, or things. Wisdom is a mental construct for achieving knowledge that is applied to a scenario by which you make a good choice that is efficacious to you or someone else. That is what wisdom is. And when you use this applied knowledge in the best case scenario, and God has lots of wisdom and knowledge because he's God and stuff, that is what wisdom is. It is about making choices that are going to be for your benefit. This man is making me really angry. It's to be a she. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice. She standeth in the top of high places by the way in the places of the past. She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, all men, I call. My voice is to the sons of man. Well, yes, God, who uses wisdom and has this personified tool, is responding to all of humanity 
to come and get you some scents. And some people did, and some people did not. And there is a price to pay for that. Oh, ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools be of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and of and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. And all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to him that hath knowledge. Okay, and it goes on, it says, I wisdom dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Okay, and it continues on, and it says here, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Well, yes, God has wisdom. That's why he's God. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning of ever the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth, when there was no fountains abounding in water. Before the mountains were settled. Now, this is interesting. It says no depths. See, if you read Genesis, it says the spirit was hovering or brooding over the waters, over the deep. It actually says, depths. So this is actually a hint that it's referring to the Holy Spirit. No, it's not. This is merely poetic language. And God has a plan that he's going to use to bring forth people to himself. And he uses knowledge, which is applied wisdom, or applied knowledge is wisdom, rather. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I really can't believe people are to the point where they just string together whatever they feel like and they they do not listen to James' warning that not all of you should be teachers. <laughs> These you'll be I'll do a stricter stricter standard. And so Proverbs is actually referring to the Holy Spirit. The term no. wisdom in Greek is Sophia. Okay, now there's obviously some Gnostic in you think? Yeah, Gnosticism. Uh, infiltration, where they try to take this Sophia term and hijack it and pervert it and all this kind of stuff. But uh, in actuality, it's, a, it's actually where they're trying to, to, to take the truth and put a spin on it and then steal the truth from Christians. So they... I, I, I would... <laughs> They're trying to to take the truth and put a spin on it. I, I have been seeing this technique being used over and over again by YouTuber after YouTuber who tries to tell you something similar in this nature. So whether it's John Pounders and them trying to say that you can totally get to God through your pineal gland and that your third eye is what that is, and that you uh, just have Satan taking that and counterfeiting that, but you can totally have a Christianized version of it, and other examples that can be given. Uh, that 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 is adventures in missing the point, and he's now trying to do it too. Well, there, see, there is a Sophia thing, but see, they just counterfeited the good thing that God has for you, where you know you have this he/she God. How is this any bit different than the shack? How is this any bit different than setting you up for Mother Earth, paganism, and all that nonsense? I, I would love if somebody knew this guy and could confirm if he was a Mason or not. Because I don't think anybody can just be this ignorant just for the sake of being ignorant without it being agenda-driven. They don't even have a clue about this. And then they also pervert what was actually originally the truth. And then they take that. That doesn't That's how sense. the devil works often. A couple things I want to... No, what you're doing is exactly how the devil works. Transforming himself into an angel of light and transforming his children into ministers of righteousness. And there you go. I want to point out real simply uh, for your observation. Proverbs 8... It's talking about someone that nobody can see crying out, teaching wisdom. 
this is unbelievably bad teaching. You, you, <laughs> you can't see wisdom. It doesn't mean it's a person. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what, who that would be in the New Testament. Who's invisible, who talks to men's hearts, oh the my Holy Lord. Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings people to repentance. Of course, people lose this correlation when they go to the New Testament. Even wisdom is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit enumerated in Isaiah 11. Y yes, the Holy Spirit gives applied knowledge to spiritual things so that you can understand spiritual things. This does not even make the slightest ounce of sense what this man is saying. I would have to tell you that this is a biblical fool. This is an unwise virgin. This is a liar. This is your garden variety, plastic Christian liar. And I'm not even specifically, like, I don't have anything personal against this guy. Um, I don't, I don't like him lying to me and everybody else. I will say that though. Um, his eyes of Jesus just absolutely sucks. <laughs> it's so bad. His hermeneutics are so bad. Two through three. Okay. So what's interesting about this topic is there's even also deuterocanonical books that refer to this wisdom character and indicating it's a she and a, it's the Holy Spirit. How is this not Gnosticism? Why would you even go to Catholic books? Are you insane? Let me find that. In the Deuterocanonical Book of Wisdom, we find this in chapter 7. Wisdom is said to be the fashioner of all things. Verse 22, because she fashions all things, is an associate in God's works. Well, they've added the word God. This is so baseless and ridiculous. I've lost all respect for this human being. I'm sorry, but I have. 8.4, and is pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Wisdom is eternal. Emanation. How is this any bit different than Shekinah of uh, Kabbalah? This, the, you have Gnosticism seeping back into the church at this book ended uh, end times period. Just like you had it back uh, a long time ago. John was fighting against this in his day. So do you have Gnosticism on the rise again at this juncture? And, you know, these YouTube channels, this really is a seedbed. I'm not going to listen anymore because I've had it. I'm tired of him blaspheming my Lord. This is absolutely disgusting. And I'm not going to subject myself to listening to this nonsense anymore. I could only go about nine minutes. Um, apparently this person, no. I'm sorry, he doesn't care about the truth. He doesn't care about the character and nature of God. So, that's fine. I mean, yeah, he's teaching Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, Sophia is a feminine figure analogous to the human soul, but also simultaneously one of the feminine aspects of God. This is Gnosticism. Uh, you cannot be saved and hold to Gnosticism. Gnostics held that she was the Sid Ziggy, I don't know what that is, female twin divine aeon oh my word of jesus oh that is just weird i.e the bride of christ and the holy spirit of the trinity how is what he's saying any bit different u.s catholic magazine see you've got the catholic church playing around with gnosticism the biblical Sophia is more than a metaphor. She is an expression of the presence of God. No, she's not. 
I knew that God was neither male nor female. Oh, my word. But I also knew God to be blah, 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 some sort of nonsense. Harlot, that's interesting. Sophia Harlot. Oh, wow, look at that, Coptic Gnostics, same thing. So he's sitting here passing off Gnosticism to unsuspecting people while telling you, oh, no, this is totally, this is a Christian version of it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, my word. Oh, look at that, Sophia, Queen of Heaven. Gnostic Aeons. Gnostic creation story. So, yeah, I, I tend to wonder what level of Mason this guy is. This hidden knowledge. Look at that. How crazy is that? Oh, look at that. How is this not Lucifer? Did you see his little fancy footwork where he says that Irenaeus was saying wrong, but then he's saying the same thing Irenaeus said? How does that work? Confusion. I'm just skimming this. This is really disgusting. I wanted to look at this really quick. Yeah, I don't think I can blow that up anymore, but, um, oh, it will let me a little bit, maybe. Whew, too big. Oh, good, it's all in another language. Or is that Latin? I I'll live without it. Well, it'll be okay. There are three books in the Bible that have come to be called the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And all of these books are addressing the same set of questions. What kind of world are we living in? And what does it look like to live well in this world? So how to be good at life. Yeah. So each of these books tackles these questions from a unique perspective, and it's important to understand all of them to get a fully biblical perspective on the good life. So, as a thought experiment, you could actually imagine each of these books as a person. So, Proverbs would be like this brilliant young teacher, and Ecclesiastes the sharp middle-aged critic, and Job would be this weathered old man who's seen a lot in his day. We're going to start by meeting the book of Proverbs, the brilliant young teacher. And she's not just smart, she's smart about everything, work, relationships, sex, spirituality. She has incredible insights things you wouldn't see on your own. Yeah, she would be the perfect friend to have around when you need really specific advice. So what makes her so smart? Well, Proverbs can see things that most people don't see. She believes that there's an invisible creative force in the universe that can guide people in how they should live. And you can't see it, just like you can't see gravity, but it affects everything that we do. So what's this force? Well, in Hebrew, it's called chokhmah. And it usually gets translated into English as wisdom. It's an attribute of God that God used to create the world. And Hokmah has been woven into the fabric of things and how they work. So wherever people are making good or just or wise decisions, they're tapping into Hokmah. And whenever someone's making a bad decision, they're working against Hokmah. Right, or as it says in Proverbs chapter 1, the waywardness of fools will destroy them, but the one who listens to wisdom lives in security. So it's like a moral law of the universe. Yeah, it's a cause-effect pattern, and no one can escape it. And Proverbs personifies all of this as a woman. Yeah, Lady Wisdom. Right, and she roams around the earth calling out, making herself available to anyone who's willing to listen to her and to learn. Which leads to the second thing Proverbs believes, that anyone can access and interact with wisdom and use it to make a beautiful life for yourself or for others. You can create with it like a designer. 
Yes, in fact, chokhmah in Hebrew isn't simply intellectual knowledge. The word is also used to describe a skilled artisan who excels at their craft, like woodworking or stonemasonry. So you show you possess chokhmah when you put it to work and develop the skill of making a good life. Okay, that makes sense. So let's do this. Let's go find some wisdom. But before you do, Proverbs has one more really important thing to consider. Chokhmah isn't some impersonal force. It's an attribute of God himself. And so in Hebrew thought, your journey to becoming wise has to begin with what Proverbs calls the fear of the Lord. It's this healthy respect for God's definition of good and evil. And true wisdom means learning those boundary lines and not crossing them. Now, all those ideas you just unpacked are in chapters 1 through 9 in Proverbs. But when I think of the book of Proverbs, I think of the collection of sayings, the Proverbs themselves. Tell me about those. Yeah, those are what you find in chapters 10 on to the end of the book. It's a collection of hundreds and hundreds of Proverbs about any and all aspects of life. And Chokhmah gets applied to them, resulting in this wise guidance to help you find a path towards success in no matter what you do. If I design my life with these sayings, life is going to be good. Yeah, or as Proverbs puts it, it'll give health to your bones, prosperity, a long, rich life. Which is a really big claim. But you can see how it's often the case. Wise people, they tend to do better. Things usually work out well for them in life. And so that is the promise and the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is really beautiful. But if we take a step back, some people would argue it's a little too simplistic. Because sometimes horrible things happen to really wise people, and sometimes foolish people get rewarded. It doesn't always work the way we think it should work. That's right. Which is why we need to go and listen to our next wise friend, Ecclesiastes the Critic. Because he's wrestled with that very problem, and he's going to push us further in our journey to find the good life.